boys and girls to the Breakdown Podcast. The Breakdown Podcast with Breaky CPK. That's, of course, myself, and I'm excited to be here and looking forward to what is a brand new week ahead of us with plenty to talk about from the week before. So thank you guys for tuning in. Hopefully you guys are excited uh, as always and uh, looking forward to a, a good podcast in front of us. I know I am. I I, I can't tell the future. I don't know if it's going to be a good podcast yet, but I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I'm sure it will turn out to be just all right, at least, if not great. So uh, you're tuning into what is episode three now, here being January 23rd, 2017. So uh, for those that may not know the Breakdown Podcast, essentially this is a Dota 2 podcast, specifically focus on, focusing, that is, on the competitive scene, and uh, pretty much a recap of sorts, as well as, you know, going over the hot topics, uh, bringing up some questions, having some, uh, some debate with... With, amongst myself, but also with you guys uh, in chat, and uh, and then the occasional bringing on the guest to talk about certain topics, uh, depending on whatever it may be. So, as always, I've had uh, at least a couple of guests on. Today I'm only going to have one guest, but a, a great guest at that. I'm looking forward to uh, bringing on Nahaz in just a little bit, in the matter of the uh, next 10 minutes or so. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Dota Pit, the event that, of course, just happened, and... Uh, Amongst uh, amongst other things, of course, the upcoming qualifiers. Maybe get his opinions on that, and just in general, how he feels the uh, the Han scene is going. So, right off the bat, though, holy crap! First things first. Shout out to uh, <laughs> uh, Big. Oh no, that was something else. Anyways, <laughs> all right. So let's let's get into episode number three now. Um, uh, again, there's plenty to talk about. The, the Dota Pit, though, is the big event that really uh, took place over this last weekend, and really took. Uh, Took the notice of uh, many of the Dota 2 followers and uh, and what was going on with said event. So the Dota 2, or the Dota Pit, I guess, the Dota Pit Season 5 uh, tournament LAN event. Sorry, I got caught up with something. <laughs> I got a little bit distracted. Anywho, uh, the event took place, uh, started on Friday, I want to say. It, it literally went into Monday morning. There were some technical issues, unfortunately. But, uh, hey, it happens. It went into Monday morning, and thus we finally had some results. And the overall result, of course, being Evil Geniuses did take home the title of the Dota Pit champions and their share of the, what was $140,000 prize pool about? I think it came to pretty much. Uh, they took home, you know, you see right here, about $63,000. Not too shabby. Not the craziest prize pool ever. But also, again, it's a pretty legit one. And obviously... Uh, there's the the com the, co the competitive side to it as well. The the players, I'm sure, excited that uh, they are the champions. But at the same time, you could tell even with the celebration ceremony that was happening. Uh, I say celebration a little bit lightly. The players were exhausted, and again, understandably, because I believe this event didn't finish until something like 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, it was something along those lines. It's something like 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, local time that is, uh, for the teams, if not even later. So. The talent, the people working it, the players and everything. Obviously, people were just damn out exhausted, uh, and that's completely understandable. And unfortunately, they uh, they were having some technical issues throughout the event. Uh, most noticeably, I guess, there had something to do with the lag, but with the the internet lag there. I, I guess with the uh, the setup that they had, they, they were getting occasional losses on certain computers and certain setups, and it was just, uh, unfortunately, kind of a, a little bit of a mess. But I will say this. They managed, and they ultimately got all the matches played, and uh, they eventually, you know, got a champion in the end. Apparently, it might have even been 4 a.m. I'm being told. So yeah, pretty damn early in the morning. I've been, to, I've done events like that myself, uh, both as a caster, and you know, obviously with Heroes of New Earth, I'm involved in that heavily, and uh, all the event experience I got from that. I, I've been, definitely had my fair share of those kind of events where you're grinding until early in the a.m. and then you realize, you know, you got to be back the next morning or. At least in this case, it didn't go late, late until the very final night. Now, um, I don't know what the flight situation was like for many of the players or the talent even. And I know I've had to do that before where I literally finish a tournament and in three hours I have to leave on a plane to go back home. So it's – and you're traveling across the world even. So, you know, it can be a little brutal sometimes. But I will say this, and, yeah, as is being brought up in chat to reiterate – it was a damn good event overall. I, at least I was entertained by it. Uh, hopefully you guys were as well for those that got the chance to watch it. Uh, but, again, you see the overall results right here. Evil Geniuses once again. The victors in the end as they took the title. But it wasn't necessarily an easy ride for them. They, they, had, a, they had a bit of struggles all throughout the tournament. Uh, you see all their matches actually went 
the distance other than the winter finals against OG, where they did defeat them two games to nothing. And that series ended up being quite the stomp, actually. But outside of that, they had to go three games against Team Faceless, which could have definitely gone either way in that third and final game. And they lost the first game, including. So Faceless, how about them? They're, they're kind of a, a team that uh, maybe many did not expect to do so well at this event. They haven't been looking too hot as of late. Uh, the Boston Major, they had a fairly disappointing result, it's safe to say. And in general, even with some, some online events, they haven't necessarily been doing all too well. But making a statement here in this event, getting all the way to the loser finals, where, of course, they lost to OG in that best of one. So there's a couple of things that I want to focus on here, though, uh, now that we've kind of recapped this real quickly. The first thing being, um, and actually, uh, let, let me get the straw pull out for this as well to ask along with you guys. But the first one was... What was the more surprising result? Was it DC being eliminated in the first round, or was it Faceless getting third place, as I was, as I was kind of touching at right there? Um, Faceless, you know, getting third place, a very impressive performance. Like I said, they haven't been doing too well going into the event, and I think it's safe to say a lot of people wouldn't have expected them to do that well in the end, but they managed to get a little bit of third place. They had to grind through the loser's bracket, but even being knocked down there, like we showed, I mean, they took the first game off the eventual champions, in the very first round, and they almost even won the series in the end. So, uh, but then they had to defeat Digital Chaos, which obviously is that's the other part of that question. You got Team Fate, or you got Virtus Pro, then they had to take out, and then Invictus Gaming. I mean, that's a gauntlet right there if I've ever seen one. DC, they're coming fresh off their victory in the ESO one Genting event a couple of weeks ago. Then here they lose. Virtus Pro, obviously a hot team in general. Uh, they eventually got knocked out by OG and then knocked out by Faces of Mentioning. And then Victus Gaming, another team. They're red hot out of China. They've been having a lot of success lately, playing a lot, a lot of matches. Uh, they lost in that best of one there, though. So Faceless, quite the grind. I, th I think you guys can understand where I'm going with this. For me personally, I feel like Faceless getting third place is probably the more surprising and the... Uh, the better result, in my opinion. But DC losing now, yes, that is a surprise of sorts, especially, you know, losing in the first round in both the, the winners and the losers. But it's not like these were pushover opponents. I mean, Team Secret, the people have their opinions, you know, with the whole uh, – with the whole – uh, puppy situation, and me personally, I'm excited for the team simply because Keizu's on it, and obviously I have a lot of history with him as a player, but uh, I, I'm not surprised to see Secret beat D Digital Chaos in the end, and I think it's hard to find anybody that necessarily would be surprised by that, but um, DC, yeah, so they fell short to them, and then and then a best of one loser's bracket, anything can happen, really. I mean, no matter the matchup, uh, you're at a land event, I mean, all these teams are definitely qualified for the most part. Elements Pro Gaming, that's another story. I don't know if they necessarily belonged here, but they needed a team to replace uh, what was, what was it? Did they replace Newbie or? No, they replaced Wings Gaming, actually. Wings Gaming was originally an invite team for this event, but Elements Pro Gaming had to step in kind of last minute because I guess Wings Gaming had some visa issues. So that's unfortunate whenever that happens, but hey, at least uh, they, they showed up and they played their matches. But outside of them, I mean, there was no pushover teams and all these teams belonged here. So, but then, yeah, again, losing best of one to a team that eventually got all the way to third place in Faceless, I don't think that's anything that's too worrisome or to uh, anything to be surprised about. But still, you know, you go from winning your first ever major event or big event in uh, the ESL1 Genting and Digital Chaos to then getting knocked out in the first round of your next land two weeks later. It's a little bit, uh, a little bit interesting to kind of look at it from that perspective. But I think Digital Chaos, I mean, they're going to be just fine. I'm not, I'm not going to overreact to this. I'm not going to be like, oh, they're going to lose in these qualifiers now. They're, there's no way they're making these, these next couple of events. I mean, that's not going to be the case. They, they had a hiccup here mixed with, you know, it's just overall tough competition. So they're knocked out. For me, again, for me personally, I really feel like Faceless getting third place was no doubt uh, the, the bigger storyline. But what do you guys think? Let's see. Uh, you guys voted here. Not many votes, but... Uh, Still votes nonetheless. It's even down the – it's split right now, you know, 12 votes, 6-6. Six and six. DC getting knocked out as well as uh, Faceless finishing third place. I mean, you guys uh, believe that uh, it's quite the split, actually. So, interesting. All right. Yeah, not the most votes, but uh, always curious to see what you guys are thinking in chat right there. So, you guys believe that DC getting knocked out maybe uh, maybe a little bit bigger of a deal than I'm making it out to be. But for me, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily that uh, – that big of a deal as again i've already given my reasons for that so 
Um, another thing to bring up here about uh, – oh, I got the wrong – we're not doing the introduction anymore. We're doing the Dota pin, baby. Um, another thing I kind of wanted to bring up was the format of the event I was a little bit troubled with, and I think I'm not alone in this. The loser's bracket, now, it's fine. In my opinion, okay, having best of one, I get it from a time constraint, and, you know, I, I get it maybe in the earlier rounds. But round three, in this case, it is – Especially the losers bracket finals. How on earth can you justify doing best of one? That in a game that is so reliant. I mean, there's so many things that can happen from not only RNG to just simply the drafts and how that can determine the games and everything. I mean, anyone will tell you legitimate way to play a game of Dota 2 or a series of Dota 2 and to figure out who the better team is. You know, to play at least a best of three, if not even a best of five in a lot of cases. But, you know, because of time constraints, it's understandable where best of three, I mean, that accomplishes enough, and you can figure it out from there. But best of one all the way through the losers, again, especially the finals, I was not a huge fan of, and I, I think organizations really need to look at this when scheduling an event. Again, I completely understand what the time constraints, but I will say uh, a, suge so a suggestion for someone who like the Dota Pit or an event that maybe wants to do uh, thinking about this in the future, the Losers Bracket Finals, they could have easily just simply made the Losers Finals a best of three and then just had the Grand Finals a best of three. Now, again, that makes the Grand Finals maybe a little less epic as far as having this big grind of a best of five. But, I mean, what, one, as we saw, you know, it ended up being quite the grind because going way into the AM and all the technical issues. So having a best of three would have been better in that sense. But... It's just, it just feels unfair to the teams that are in the loser's bracket. And a team like Team Faceless that grinded all the way uh, throughout to get to that point, and then all of a sudden they just lose one game to a team that got knocked down, going to the grand finals, and then that's it. So to truly determine which team should have faced off against EG, definitely would have felt more comfortable if it was a best of three. And again, they could have just simply made those two series best of threes instead. And rather than a best of one going into a best of five, that also just seems so odd. It seems so awkward in terms of uh, having the format dr dramatically change uh, going from uh, one round to the next. So not a huge fan of the best of one loser's bracket, especially in the finals, but again, it's what they decided to do. Now, I, I, I do know it's, it's interesting to look at my suggestion because if you look at the grand finals, if they made it best of three, it actually would have been OG winning the series two games to one. So that would have changed the outcome and... I mean, maybe. Now, you could argue that if they knew it was best of three going into it, then perhaps the play would have been a little bit different. But as the results stand, it would have been a victory for OG. So that does it. But, again, would they have even made it to the loser or the grand finals if the loser's bracket finals was best of three? So they're really, I guess you really can't just simply look at that and be like, oh, that's how it would have played out. Um, but anyways, I uh, what's up, Nahaz? I see you in chat right there. Uh, going to have uh, Nahaz join me here in just a second. But, yeah, just finishing out my points right here as far as uh, not a big fan of the best of one loser's bracket, but is what it is. So I, I do hope future events, though, they really keep that in mind. And, and, I, and also, even if that means then not having these loser matches on the main stage, making them best of three just for that, I think it's just so much more. You're getting so much more out of it. You can have, like, an off stream doing it rather than just trying to work with these main stage time constraints and thus having, you know, best of one losers matches as a result. So, I uh, yeah, I've never been a huge fan of best of ones in a, in a genre in a game like this, at least in the later rounds. You know, initially, okay, whatever. But later rounds, I, I just don't – I'm not, not a fan. So, um, other than that, yeah, I think that pretty much uh, covers, though, what uh, I wanted to talk about initially right here. Um, there's, there's still plenty more to talk about the Dota Pit, of course, but uh, I'm going to have somebody to, to join me to uh, help with said discussion. So give me just a second here while I set up and uh, get ready to bring on my guest here. Let me give the one, the only Nahaz a call. And he's in, he's in chat, at least. So he answers a Skype call now. But excited to have him on, talking about some Dota Pit and uh, who knows what else, so... There we go. Looks like you're on the well, Haas. How's it going, man? It's going pretty well. Happy to have you on. Happy to have you on the podcast here. Yeah, man. Nice to talk to you. Yeah, I, I've never talked with you before. I, I'm newer to this scene, so I, yeah, I, I, I know about you. I think you, we met but... very briefly uh, at, at TI. Uh, you you knew some of the complexity guys from the from the Hondas, but yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I've never been to TI, so I wouldn't have been there, but 
Somewhere. Oh no, not oh it was what I, I we've <laughs> anyway, we shook hands at some point, but <laughs> I want it's to good to finally it. talk to you. Exactly, exactly. No, but I'm happy to have you on. I know that uh you like to talk a, a lot of Dota two and, and numbers especially, of course, seems to be your your specialty, but just in general. So I'm happy to have you on to talk about the, the Dota Pit event that just took place. I assume you watched a fair amount of it or yeah. looked into yeah. it. I, I mean I think it's a shame that when most people talk about the Dota Pit event that they're probably going to be talking about some of the problems and the negatives because yeah. uh, the Dota, when it was finally played, was terrific. We had great quality matches and uh, a, a barn burner of a grand finals went all five games. And you know, as you said, OG, uh, sorry, EG were able to pull it out there uh, in the end. It, and I really give the, the talent and the players a whole lot of credit for delivering uh, what was a great viewer experience during the actual games. Yeah, no, I... You and I both have been through those experiences, I'm sure, you know, at the at set events and where you're just grinding it out and going into the AM. And as talent, I, I as talent, it's tough enough, but I can only imagine as players, too. You know, people like to I, I feel like I've heard this before. Where it's like, oh, they're, they're just gamers. You know, how tiresome could it really be? They're just yeah. playing a video game. It's a mental it, it's draining, man, from, uh, from game it, to game. Look, it, it's it, it's draining enough. I, I don't know if this is true for everybody, but at least for me and and probably for most people, it's draining enough playing rank pubs. But I, I can tell <laughs> you, uh, it is it's a whole new level of pressure and of concentration that these players are under at the land events, and it's part it's partly why um, it's partly what makes land events so fun and so special as a spectator. But you really do have to respect what these guys go through. And yeah. unfortunately, we were very lucky to have two battle-hardened teams uh, that had been tested before in these grand finals. And so they were able to keep their focus. Uh, one of the things that I, I talked to some other people about is if Faceless, for example, makes the grand final you know, are they able to keep up that same quality of Dota through all the delays and yeah. I mean, that final series lasting seven hours? That's ridiculous. Seven hour best of five. Yeah. Um, I, you know, something I was talking about right before I had you come on, I'm actually curious on your opinion on it. It was best of one all the way yeah. to the grand finals from the losers. Um, right. I was I was mentioning, you know, at least the loser bracket finals make that best of three. But what, what are your thoughts on that, though? Can I can I do a very uh, economist thing? And can I can I answer your question with a question? Okay, sure. What would you rather have? Would you rather have uh, that kind of a format, or would you rather have single elimination? So my, my suggestion specifically for this event was the losers bracket finals arguably should have been best of three, and then the grand finals best of three. Because again, yes, I, I get I, that there's only so much time, but I think that yes. could have been better. I, I don't. I don't think for this particular event, I don't think there's any question that. Uh, having a, a best of one lower bracket final into a best of five grand final is very silly. I actually yeah. think uh, this is one of the things I had a back and forth with Red Eye over Twitter about that um, I think it, it should actually be in every tournament rules that the tournament admins, if there's a best of five final schedule, that the tournament admins have the right to convert that to a best of three if there are scheduling delays prior to that. Because... I mean, it's just it, it really isn't fair to anybody. Like I said, the the conditions were such everybody there that was that was there as talent and casting uh, really sucked it up. The players were in a position to play some good Dota still. But yeah. uh, under slightly different circumstances, I could I could have seen some really bad things happening. Yeah, that's it's it's such it's such a tough place, though, because at the same time, you know, there's a lot more to it than just simply like there's the sponsorships and the marketing of all of it. And, you know, they've maybe been hyping up this idea that it's best of five. Yet all of a sudden, if you know, mm -hmm. it's best of three, then that can screw over with what they had wow. planned. So, I mean, and it's but, something too. the irony is that ESL has actually taken some flack for that in the past, having best of three yeah. uh, grand finals. But that's a big a big part of it. Uh, the other thing that bears mentioning with this, that there are a lot of other venues that I've worked at in this business that there would not have been a choice. I mean, they were lucky to be at a venue in Croatia that they were able to carry the event on until 4 a.m. and sure. finish things up. You know, there if we'd have been in at, at Frankfurt, I mean, there are noise ordinances uh, in that part of the city. Uh, I, it's not clear to me that we would have able, been able to. We, it's not clear to me that we would have been able to finish the event. Period. <laughs> uh, and and there are there are a number of other things. But by the way, let me actually answer the question that you asked and say uh, I I would actually. I would typically rather see double elimination, even if it, it means you have to have best of one elimination matches fairly deeply. I, I think double yeah. elimination is just at least the way these teams play in esports. 
uh, I think you find out a lot more about a lot more teams. I think that, you know, Knox and I had it, Knoxville and I had this out uh, a couple of times. And I think for single elimination, you really only learn who the top four teams are in a tournament. Whereas I think double elimination does, it's just much more informative about a team. I mean, you, you take a team like newbie is a great example. Okay. Newbie finished bottom eight at the Boston major, right? Big disappointment. There were a team that I had top four going in easy. They lost to add Finham yeah. first round. So how do you, and everyone's happy. How do you they really did. rank a team like that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but no, I, you know, I wasn't. <laughs> well, the, yeah, I, d- I do take back to the Boston major that I actually had my opinions on that as well. And you know, that's, Obviously, being that major event and kind of a, uh, a good uh, way to, to look at what we're talking about here. So that was that single elimination as you're getting at. Now, for me, I, I, I again, I do prefer a double elimination in the end. However, if that means even best of ones. But, however, with that specific event, I if you're going to have a single elimination, then you need to have the initial phase more... Uh, drawn out or or like it, I think it was what it was four different groups of four teams and in the first place those groups like it felt like they were somewhat almost randomly selected and put together it wasn't a wow. necessarily That's a all- huge what's up this has been a thing for a long time it, it, at a lot of these dota lands that the the group assignments are are yeah. pretty capricious and you know I, I guess everybody has their own their own power rankings I mean heck you know valve pulls like 50 different people and we still don't ever agree with the TI group so I, I guess it's not you're never gonna find something to please uh, everybody but I actually I've never understood why um, tournaments are very averse to I think you could go ahead and play a couple of the winner's bracket matches uh, at the tail end of the group stage. I mean, you never, you always want to have, and this is something that we learned at TI4, that you, you always want to have every team that's making a trip to a big land like this, you want to have at least show up on the main stage one time, mm-hmm. right? Because some of these teams are coming a long yeah. way. Um, but I, I, I don't see the harm in playing a couple of winner's bracket matches, maybe the first round winner's bracket matches, uh, the tail end of the group stage if you have to, to conserve time at the venue so that you don't have to do these crazy things like best of one elimination matches. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, I could live with that. I mean, there's just there really is just so many different these style of formats that you can do, but it's uh, it's been interesting to see how that's going to – what what tournaments yep. decide to use when they go into it. So we'll see what the next major is about. I, yep. I, I thought I heard something that they – have they already announced that it's going to be a single elimination as well, or no yet? They uh, well, it's Valve, so they haven't. I oh, mean, haven't you're not going to get yet. the details for, uh, until, but it the dates of the event, yeah. uh, unless the format is drastically different, uh, there are only I believe there are only three four days at the venue, so it's it's the the, the yeah. number the venue the event schedule is the same as the Boston schedule. Yeah. So it's highly highly suggestive that we're going to have the same format. All right, well, uh, we'll we'll have plenty of discussions on that as it gets closer, and is what it is. We get the information on that, so. But yeah, so anyways, the Dota Pit event here <laughs> that we just yep. had, uh, we did have the best of one through the losers bracket, and it it was what it was. Now another another question that I brought up real quickly too was, uh, what was more surprising to you, the fact that Faceless got third place and they had their grind, or was it DC getting knocked out despite finishing first at the ESL One Genting event a couple weeks ago? I mean, I think. Um I think DC may well have been suffering from the same thing that you've you've seen newbie suffer from a little bit, and that's just uh, a little bit of land fatigue. I mean, I, I know um, you know Knox ran into uh, I believe it was KP at the airport uh, after it, it, at the beginning of Genting, and KP's like, "Oh man, this is like this is our third land in a month. We're just we're beat," and and that that's a thing, and uh, especially with all the travel that you're asking these players to go th- to go through. I, I, DC looked a little bit tired to me, and I also think that we're we're lucky that um, a lot of the top teams are just really close right now. Uh, you know, you you look at. Uh, EG is knocked on the door pretty much every tournament that they've been in. Uh, OG is obviously obviously a powerhouse, although you know they for a team that is in everybody's presumptive top three, they have some questions that they're going to need to answer going into Kiev. Yeah, no, that, that's something I've definitely noticed myself. Is joining the scene recently. I, I've always understood that they, there's kind of been these top tier teams, and then maybe like the tier two and so on. But I really feel like competition, especially even in America as of late, is 
really starting to step up. There's a lot of teams that are up and coming that are all of a sudden kind of closing that gap more and more. In the European region, we got these qualifiers now announced that uh, I was going to break that down a little bit later on. But, I mean, you look at these qualifying. Who the hell is going to come out? I mean, we don't really know. It's There's no yeah. clear victor, in my opinion. Well, so that's – and that's partly why I was happy to see the announcement of, of some of the expanded qualifiers and new formats. It sure. very likely means that there are going to be more qualifier positions available and less automatic bids. And, it, you, you know, you go back – I can give you the numbers back through Frankfurt. Qualifying teams have done successful. They've on a per bid basis, they've done better yeah. than invited teams. And it's just it's highly suggestive. There's there are a lot of good players out there. There have been a lot of good players out there for a very long time. But for, for the first time, we're seeing the pool of actual tier one teams uh, much, much deeper than it has been in years past. Yeah. So. Another thing I wanted to bring up here about the Dota pit and having you on especially is uh, yep. kind, of, kind of talking about uh, some specific maybe like hero picks that we saw that, you know, with this new patch 7.0, obviously that, sure. that's always bringing a lot of interest from, from event to event, kind of seeing some trends uh, that have taken place. Uh, sure. For me, and I assume maybe some other people too, is that uh, the not the MVP hero, I guess, but the one that really stood out the most was Lone Druid, right? Lone yeah. Druid really kind of surprised a lot of people. What was your thoughts on that? I, I think you've seen you've seen Lone Druid uh, trending up for a while now in high level pubs, and you have to kind of you have to parse the data pretty carefully. But high level pub data trends do show up in these tournaments, uh, and in particular, uh, my rule is whenever you see a hero whose whose pick rate and win rate in 5K plus pubs are both spiking at the same time, that's something you really pay attention to. And Lone, Lone Druid, uh, his pick rate versus pre uh, 7.0 has doubled. In 5K plus pubs, and he's now into the top 15 uh, in win rates overall heroes. So yeah, he's a player that a lot of good players are 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 experimenting with, and it, the talents just help him so much. I mean, he's like a mini sniper. You know, you saw yeah. in the very last game, you saw an an Ana Eminence Ember Spirit remnanting away and still being right clicked by the by the RTZ Lone Druid. I mean, yeah. th this is a hero that uh, it, it's. You know, capitalist called him uh, on Twitter sniper with an escape mechanism. <laughs> and, a lot and, and, and oh, by the way, a free a free tanky bear. And that's that's the other thing Jenkins brought up to me last night was uh, that you know the bear in an effort to bring the hero back into the meta, the bear got buffed several times to the point where the bear is is viable as a utility spell without items, which is a really really big deal. You don't you, it just it affects the hero's buildup in such a positive way in, in, in much the same way that the Ember Spirit has been helped uh, by his spell damage buffs that you're not, you know, you're not sitting around waiting for your Ember Spirit to get a Battle Fury anymore. You're not sitting around waiting for your Lone Druid to get a Radiance anymore. And that's in this kind of a meta where you want to be fighting and pressuring objectives from a very early stage of the game. That's just a, it's a huge buff to the hero's utility. Yeah. Uh, what were there any from this event specifically? Was there anything else that stood out to you, maybe when it came to sure. some heroes and stuff? Well, the biggest thing is not uh, to me that stood out is not the heroes; it's it's the radiant side, uh, the radiant advantage. I, I tweeted this out a week or so ago yeah. that if you look at all heroes across every single hero across every one of the skill brackets from sub two k to five k plus. Every single hero in every skill bracket has a higher win rate on Radiant than on Dire, and almost all of them by at least 5%. Now, if you look at uh, at Dota Pit, obviously small sample size. Before the grand final, Radiant was 17 and 9. So, you know, not the biggest amount of data. But if you look at some of the other leagues that are going on, if you look at DPL in China, if you look at the Starlighter I-League Season 3 qualifiers, which are going on right now, definitely check those out. Uh, overall, in those two leagues, Radiant has about a 60% win rate in a sample of a little over 300 games. That's Jeez. that's starting to be really significant. And I think when you're talking about the fact that you basically nullified Dyer's Rosh advantage, that most of our brains are wired to uh, – there's a reason every side-scrolling game you've ever played left scrolls to right. left to right, yeah. right? It's it's a very powerful it, it's psychology. It's also uh, there's the placement of the radiant tier one towers makes it a little bit easier to TP without being in vision. Uh, the shrine it, the shrine placement I think is a little bit favoring radiant on the bottom side of the map. But it, the long and short of it is radiant is amassing a pretty huge statistical advantage in these games and. 
you know, I had I discussed this with gods a little bit. Uh, it's not clear to me because if you look across the sc the skill brackets, the magnitude of the radiant advantage declines as MMR goes up. So it's not clear that the radiant advantage is going to be as is going to be nearly as relevant for pro games. We're starting to get some data now that suggests that it is, and it may have been masked a little bit because newbie. One of the things that you have to pay attention to if you're breaking down the meta right now is the early game rotations are nowhere near optimized for these teams. Everybody yeah. is still figuring out how best to use shrines. There's a very complicated calculus that 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 goes with the interaction between your mid, for example, isn't going to be low when he gets harassed in lane nearly as often because he's got that trying to go with his bottle crow. But then your roaming supports are going to have more mana to work with. So it's kind of a complicated calculus, and, and no team has really figured it out. The team that's come closest has probably been newbie on Dire. Okay, they have they had for a few games there some very optimized dire side rotations, and that may have masked a little bit the huge radiant advantage of other I've seen. Well, wasn't there there was some with DC in the the grand finals against Newbie, wasn't it, where they yeah. swapped up their choice yes. of choosing? They chose dire. Uh, I yeah, well, I, I yeah yeah I think uh, they they took dire they took dire away from Newbie, okay, and yeah. it was it was very very obvious. That uh, newbie, newbie expected to be given dire for good reason. Uh, they had been been giving dire in the online matches that they played in China yeah. because, again, you're seeing radiant with a pretty big statistical advantage in DPL and other in-house leagues. And so newbie had put a lot of work into optimizing their dire side rotations. And when DC took that away from them, newbie, yeah, they they, they kind of looked like every other team still mm -hmm. figuring the patch out. Kind of threw them for a loop there. Yeah, yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Okay, so. That's definitely uh, a little bit something different to look at, perhaps than just simply the heroes that are being picked. But uh, there well, have I mean, the heroes. It's again, it, it's tough to say because it's a small sample. You look at you yeah. look at Ember Spirit. Ember Spirit's the hero. The the of the w heroes that were picked frequently, Ember Spirit's the hero that had a very high win rate. Uh, again, I I do think that hero is a lot better in this patch. In he is. It used to be that in a pro game like playing Ember Spirit. If you got behind on your Ember Spirit player, you almost had to go into a four protect one yeah. for a while. Uh, whereas now the Ember Spirit has enough spell damage that he can still participate and be active around the map. Uh, so that hero is a lot better, but I don't know that we have enough data at the pro level to make really strong conclusions about most of the heroes yet. One hero that has been a hot topic, and uh, it's been a mix of we've seen a lot of bans, especially initially, and it's kind of maybe died off on the bans a little bit, but we see picks, and it was pretty significant in this event too. Uh, Underlord. Underlord, a hero that comes to mind. Now, there's, there was one event where oh my God. I remember seeing this win percentage was awful, but maybe that was because people just didn't really understand how to play him and yeah. use him well, but you sound like you, you like this hero. There's reasons why. Underlord is a, uh, as, as a strategist, Underlord is a nightmare to prepare for. He's, he, is, he is nearly as difficult to, in my opinion, to coach a team to use correctly as he is to prepare for, but... When you look at what OG in particular, OG of all the top teams right now is by far the best at terms in terms of their overall macro positioning on the map and putting pressure on threatening the largest area of the map with the smallest amount of resources invested so that they can still get things like farming done. Uh, the way that they use Underlord, like they will get multiple heroes with wave clear and they'll have one lane pushed up to a tower. They'll go take that tower and then because they had a wave clear advantage, they'll just rift to another lane. And it, it's like yeah. they get a couple free towers a game when they're playing Underlord. And I think as as again, it, it all it, the last couple of metas, it's all started with the um, it's all started with those early game rotations getting locked down and optimized. And once you see that happen. I think you're going to see a lot of teams really start to take advantage of basically Underlord lets you five man two lanes at once. It's pretty absurd because that's the thing too. His skill set allows him, yeah, this push is so strong. And the Pit of Malice is actually a very solid crowd control ability too. It's a very yeah. good zoning tool for as you're pushing in, you know, prevents them from ideally, you know, initiating effectively. So, um, yeah, th there's reasons why it seems like he is up there and kind of a popular hero. And that showed once again here at the Dota Pit. So, um, is there a hero that comes to mind, kind of putting you on the spot here, but uh, that sure. maybe hasn't been 
picked up a lot or man or whatever that you're like, why aren't teams maybe trying this out a little bit? Is there anything that does come to mind? Well, uh, I mean, so obviously Lycan isn't in captain's mode. Um, yeah. it, there is. So I, I guess if you put me on the spot, I'd probably say uh, Necrophos is yeah. a bit is starting to look a little bit like the the poor man's Omni Knight, where Omni Knight had this like absolutely ridiculous pub win percentage for six months. He was the only hero up around 60 percent and it was in every skill bracket and it was just. It was stupid. And then all of a sudden, pro teams were like, oh, yeah, we can pick this hero. And Ice Frog nerfs him. Uh, Necrophos is kind of has kind of risen to be kind of the new king of pubs. And you wonder if some of the pro teams are, are going to start to use that hero as well. I, I don't think he's nearly as as obviously unbalanced as as Omni was. Um, you know, I, I still do think that this is a good pushing patch. I still do think that uh, Visage has a place in the metagame. And, you know, as long as Lil exists, you're still going to see that hero. Yeah. Uh, Earth Spirit is still obviously really good, despite, like, because I said Lil a moment ago, I, Lil is actually complaining on Twitter that Earth Spirit needs to be fixed. It's like, come on, dude. You, you really want Ice Frog to buff you even more? Wait, so, buff Earth Spirit? No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, no, no. That's going to buff or, certain no, no, players, Or too. buff Lil personally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 let's let's go ahead and buff like Jerax and Crit and Lily. I yeah. mean, and Kaka. That sounds like a good idea. Nah, not not so much. Yeah, ne Necro. That's actually a good example. I mean, he does feel like he could be one of those just simply a a pub stomp style of heroes, though. And you sure. know, th there are those heroes that don't necessarily translate over to the competitive scene as effectively as others. Where in the pub scene, well, though, they happen to be able to take over games. Well, but and and there's a common denominator too to all of them. I mean, if you certainly if you go down at certainly three k, but probably even four to five k, uh, there's a reason that all of these your your Omni Knights, your Necrophos, your Treant Protectors, your Underlords, usually built with utility with the mech. You know, pub games. What's the number one thing that happens in your pub games? Is it frustrates the hell out of you. It's you win a fight. And everybody goes back to base and everybody goes yeah. in farms. Sustain heroes win a lot of pubs because, hey, guys, I'm going to heal everybody up. Let's let's go hit that tower, please. <laughs> I'll heal you. And your teammates are like, well, all right, maybe I'll go hit the tower before I do Ancients. I, yeah. I mean, it works, guys. Dota is about towers at, at, at every level. Nothing more frustrating than that. I, I hear you. I've actually been playing a bit of Necro myself at the, the 3K range. I just hey. spoke the 3K. Got to start somewhere. Good but, stuff, man. Yeah, it's 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 been fun, but yeah, no, I've definitely ran into that many of times where you you want to find and they're all like, ah, I gotta find my my next item now. It's like, push objectives. That's how you win games. All right. Um, it absolutely is. It is. That's the one thing like it triggers me so hard in Pub Dota. It's you know, it, it, really, winning a fight does not mean that much if you can't convert it into objectives, and that's yeah. it, throughout. It's it's been so many metas in a row now that uh, the successful there's a you know there's a conversion stat right it, the teams that are able to turn one fights that are able to turn Roshans into map control into a vision advantage it's yeah you know they're the fourth and fifth re they're the they're the third and fourth resource everybody everybody talks about golden XP because you see those at the end of the game on the scoreboard but you know vision and map control are their their resources in exactly the same sense you have to you have to plan to accumulate them and you have to talk about once you've accumulated them how are you going to leverage them into an advantage yeah yeah uh, you, you know obviously uh, Swinomel is very well from complexity and I do one thing I um, you know, really watched about him or learned from him over the years of Gaston with Han and now into the Dota scene is that he is a very, very big proponent of objectives. Objectives is how you win the game. Sounds like we both agree, so. Oh, it seems like my Skype cut out real quickly. Oh, no, there that's my, okay. sorry, that's my, I had to cough, <laughs> so I muted my mic. Uh, no, there's a reason that, uh, that EG and other teams are, for example, picking support Leshrac. That's something that in the yeah. current patch, at least, the complexity really started. Uh, and, you know, you, you have to have heroes that can do tower damage quickly, so that, it, because in the early game, obviously, respawn times are short, and there's nothing more frustrating than getting a couple of kills in a lane and not being able to to do significant damage to that tower. Yeah. So that Leshrac with the the splitter again, and look at the builds too. Lightning is gone, right? It's all it's all back to split earth malady. Uh, sorry, it's back to split earth and edict yeah. again, where you are able to win that fight and you're able to do at least half that tower self now. 
Yeah, there's one other here actually before uh, we, we start to kind of wrap up here. But Brewmaster, we t we actually saw make some appearances. Yes. Where that felt like that came out of left field and one that was like, well, uh, does this really work? So, your thoughts on that? I, I mean, I think Brewmaster is really, really good potentially when you're OG and when you can run him in the off lane. I think he's a terrible safe lane here. Yeah. But <laughs> I think the big thing. Um, when they're able to run S4 on his Brewmaster as an offlane, OG is a team, again, going into that, that map awareness. I mean, MAD does such a good job coaching that team. They're the best coach team in the world right now. Uh, they were obviously single elimination tournaments. One of the big things about them is that they favor teams that, that do scouting and preparation because, again, you don't, you, know, you don't get to see that team in action and possibly lose to them and get to bump down to the lower bracket and they have that extra information. And OG is able, they're able to take fights at the right times and in the right places on the map such that, hey guys, if we win a fight here, we're going to be able to take two towers. And that's where the Brewmaster comes into play, that they can pick a lineup that doesn't necessarily look that great in terms of control or disables. But if, if, if you're always fighting with Brew's ult up in key places, you have plenty of control and disable just with that one hero. Yeah. And so it's it's great for them. But again, you saw the game where they tried to run no tail on a safe lane brewmaster yeah. and, and you just you just lack damage. The the progression just isn't there. Yeah. I was looking over all you played five games, it looks like, and he only won two of those actually. So Right. Yeah, overall just And he's a, and he's a very, very good I mean, he's one of the better brew players, uh brew players in the world. Yeah. But you know, you, you, you put him up there with Ferrari and, and, and a couple of others that are the best that we've seen on the hero. But it's just it doesn't fit the meta right now. You you really do. He doesn't he gives you that control, but you really do need both spike and sustained damage potential. And Brewmaster just doesn't he doesn't do that well enough. Yeah. Well, Nahaz, I uh, want to thank you. Thank you for joining me on this uh, on this podcast here. Always, uh, always fun to talk to you. Look forward to to more in the future. But are you wearing what? Are you wearing an EG shirt, by the way? I, I, I am, man. I, I got it. Well, Bleeding blue. First of all, first of all, you know, it was it, when Charlie was the manager of EG. He hooked me up, so you know, I, I'm I'm I, I will come on. I'm still I still remember being a PhD student, man. I I, I, I love my free T shirts, of course. Yeah, but and, and you know, yeah, I gotta I gotta rip my voice. Out. I was I was very I. I I still don't have an OG shirt. I got to fix that. But I, I was just very proud of, of those two teams. I, I know the players. Um, you know, I, I, I'm very gratified in particular to see Andreas, to see Crit uh, having so much success as at, at transitioning to the captain's role, which I was sure he was going to be great in. Those OG guys are they're, – they're an incredible team, a tight-knit group, and they've really built what they have from the ground up. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I was going to be wearing one of those two teams' shirts today. Awesome. Well, got the EG one on because obviously they, they want it all. So, uh, there you go. Nahaz, uh, thanks again, man. Really do appreciate. Any shout outs you got before I let you go here? Uh, none that I can think of. Shout out to the to again to the Beyond the Summit crew and to Toby that did a did a great job at Dota Pit under under less than ideal circumstances. I and and I I still don't understand why it's 2017 and we're at the mercy of servers for for major pro That's, lands that that shouldn't yeah. be a thing uh you know unfortunately the reborn client uh broke local lobbies you can't use that as a solution really it lands anymore if the game crashes you lose the whole thing that needs to be fixed in the worst way and it needs to be fixed yesterday yeah. uh other than that though you know great event and you know go watch the games if you haven't because it was some it was some neat dota and we got some more in store it was, it was. And, and yeah, we're going to be going over that here shortly as well. But Nahaz, I'm going to let you go. Again, you can find him at Nahaz Dota on Twitter. Definitely uh, check him out. And, again, really excited to have you on, perhaps in the future as well. Appreciate talking with you, man. You too, man. All right. So there we go. Had Nahaz on. And uh, definitely, uh, as expected, uh, pl plenty to talk about there, plenty to go over. So, Really happy to have him on and uh, going over some numbers as well as uh, that. That was interesting to hear though about the his take on the whole uh, the radiant versus the dire and the radiant advantage. It's not something that you know, a lot of people may think about. It's a lot of times it's more the heroes, if anything, as far as the advantages go and that that draft specifically. But that that coin flip before a match starts, or I guess it doesn't necessarily always happen that way. But you know when the team select which side they want to be in and then who first pick or second pick. I mean, there's there's that there's that mind game before the draft even begins. And then going into it, and right now it does. It, it seems like that uh, 
that Radiant is the way to go for the most part. And perhaps more teams do need to work on the rotations or the uh, their strategies when it comes to the dire side um, as far as uh, how they want to win some games. So, again, appreciate Nahaz joining me and uh, excited to, uh, to uh, talk with them again in the future. All right, guys. So, again, I'm going to continue on with the show here. So, like I said, for those that are just tuning in and maybe a little confused as far as what's going on. So, again, this is the, the Breakdown Podcast here. It's a Dota 2 podcast. Um, I like to bring guests on to talk about certain subjects and topics and uh, as experts of sorts or well, even that or even uh, simply an interview. And uh, that's what that segment was right there. So, uh, but going to continue on and going to start talking about now. Um, events that are upcoming, uh, we kind of hinted at a couple of those a little bit, as, as Nahas mentioned there. I mean, there's plenty of Dota 2 action. That's going to be continuing to happen into the new year here with the new patch and everything. Uh, and specifically, a couple of events that are most worthy of uh, talking about. Let, which one should we start? Eh, let's, start with, uh, let's start with the uh, the DAC event, actually. Let's start with the DAC event um, here. Well, actually, you know what? Something I needed to do first. Before we do all of that, before we do all of that, first I'm gonna play. Uh, I'm gonna play a video for you guys. We're gonna we're gonna get some free tips, some free information, uh, and then I'm uh, I'm I actually may have a guest that I'm gonna be bringing on for to talk about these upcoming events. So let's do that first, and then we'll get back into uh, looking forward to some more uh, to some events coming up. So sit tight, guys. Uh, we'll be right back. I think that that also. You know, a lot of the players, maybe at like 4 or 5k, they know what to do in the early game and mid game. Pretty much like, you know, they, you know, you go to each lane and you, you know, what kind of meta is there. But then later it's, they, you get to a situation you're not used to and it's, you, you, you need to, like, it, it kind of gets a lot more complex because you need to, you need to evaluate, all right, what, what's the, what are your heroes against theirs and strengths, but also, okay, how much did they farm? How many times did they kill you? What kind of, uh, how have they itemized? So you need to look at all those things before you decide, you know, should I, should we go five, five man them? Should we just defend? Should we try to pick them off? Like it's, it's really, really complex. And in this game, like, I guess you, you almost like almost in all games you have to five on five at some point. And since PA doesn't get BKB, it's, it's pretty hard for you to five on five. But right now you also can't split push because they have what Ricky and let's slow this down here. And they have um yeah X to call you. Now I would like to they could both take this tower and keep pushing and try to force a buyback and then go Roche. But they could also take this and just go Roche. Roche and Pierre would be really, really nice. If he starts farming jungle now, I would like almost cry. I'm pretty sure Roche is up. Yeah, Roche is up. There's like either you push and you force buyback or you can just go rush right now. Farming your jungle just like makes my eyes bleed almost. It's this is like this is easy rush, free rush. Or you could at least force buyback. You know, if if at least start hitting the tower and just try to make them buyback. This is just yeah, this is really, really, really bad. This is like something you must not do. Like if if you kill four heroes from that team and you're so close to their base, just go up and hit the base a couple of times and you know, if they don't buyback, maybe you can get the tower. If they do buyback, you can just back off, and then you're really happy that you know the buyback. I did it. The worst feeling in the world is to buyback, and then they just you know enemy team just back off, and you're like, all right, hmm. I guess I got buyback, so they they won't take my racks. But yeah, you kind of if you want to buyback, you you really want to fight, just to feel like you don't just waste your buyback. It's kind of it's kind of funny thing because you don't waste your buyback if you buy back and they don't get the backs and the back off. But still, players when they buy back, they really want to fight. So in all these games and all these, there's so many times where they have an advantage and they don't push it and they don't you know capitalize on that advantage, which better players would have done. And that just means that you know, if let's say you go for a situation where you have 80% chance to win. Then because you, you don't use that advantage, you maybe now have 75% chance to win. So it's, it's, they just, they just, I see a lot of times where it kind of give a handout to the opponent saying, you know, 
you you have a here here you have a chance to to win or get back into the game. All right, welcome back, guys. Welcome back to the podcast here, and uh, hopefully you guys enjoy that free bit of information. You know, it's always uh, fun to learn some stuff uh, with the help of Pugna in that case, uh, PVGNA. Uh, of course, uh, for those that don't know by now, I actually put a link in chat, uh, with a stop by link to there. Uh, it's a uh, referral link uh, where if you would like to sign up for the Pugna.com website, it's actually an educational Dota 2 website. They have a lot of videos, very similar to that was just a short clip of one. Uh, they got a lot of videos from a lot of, you know, big, big names, including names like Chessy and Fogged uh, that help represent them and uh, including also content that I create for them. Now, I don't create necessarily teaching videos. I'm only a 3K player, but I do actually do a weekly video recap for them, and I just finished the one for today, actually. So uh, for that that takes place for this last week, including the Dota Pit and stuff. But anyways, you get the point. Uh, so there's also weekly content that I put on there. It's all exclusive to the website. Again, you can sign up for it. Uh, and if you do sign up for it, be sure to use my referral link either below my channel or the one that I posted in chat right there. So big shout out to once again to Pugna there. And uh, thanks for that uh, that free free tip right there. Uh, all right, so going to be advancing on and talking about uh, previewing even some upcoming events. There's a couple of qualifiers that are that are going to be taking place uh, th starting this week even, and in some cases one's already started. Uh, there's both the Dota 2 Asian Championships continue, uh, as well as the Star Ladder, our League Star Series, takes place both starting this week. And uh, information was actually just released for the uh, Dota 2 Asian Championships. So first, we're going to actually look at that one first. Uh, but before I even do that, I am going to be bringing on a guest here. I figure, you know what, it makes more sense to have somebody to talk with uh, about uh, what's going on rather than just... Uh, blabbering with myself so i'm gonna bring out a buddy of mine uh known by serenity or as i like to call him oh, danny Jesus. i think i think i was calling you donny donny <laughs> 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 yeah your name's donny all right uh no serenity though uh you can follow him at so you can see the twitter right there let's your webcam's looking funky man yeah dude my webcam is some, super bad you got some green glow going on <laughs> i'll just be the hulk today honestly it's all good i, I bet you're hoping og won with all that green man um, they did not honestly, know. I love both teams. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I have a soft spot for OG just because, like, back in Han, the the one team that I was super into was um, the Fnatic team. Yeah. So, like, I've been I've been watching No Tail and Fly play for a long time, but you know, whatever. <laughs> well, it's funny you bring up that Fnatic team because actually, there's a. Uh... So we'll start. We'll start with that actually. So the Dota Two Asian Championships. Been talking about that. It's that's coming up here. Uh, the qualifiers were just announced for it for the other regions. Now the Chinese region actually already took place. Uh, they already had four teams that qualified from it. We we were actually we've already been over that. Uh, what were the two? It was Invictus Gaming and VGJ, as well as LFY and IG Vitality. So those four teams are going along with the invited teams. Uh, but now we need to figure out one more team from each of these regions. So we already talked about this a little bit last week, but personally, it's uh, I think it's a little ridiculous that four Chinese teams going to go, and then there's only one from each of the other regions. But this hey, is DAC. It's a right? Chinese event. Yeah, it is the DAC yeah, that we're referring to here. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a little confusing because Star Ladder is also in China, and so it's kind of yeah. the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, it's just all these events are in China, right? It's just it's, it's Dota's big over there. Dota's big over there. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so l let's start looking at the actual uh, qualifiers here. We'll start with the European region. Um, and I, I say, you know, you, you're bringing up Fnatic from, from the Haunt days and you like them and everything. Well, there happens to be a team in these qualifiers, of course, the, the somewhat Fnatic-esque team. Uh, of course, I'm referring <laughs> to uh, January 25th. That's, Best uh, name ever. <laughs> that name makes no sense. Yeah, I guess it's just when they entered uh, their team in the roster or something like that, but uh, probably trying to get on the monitor here. There we go. All right, so, but anyways, these are the eight teams in total. Ad Phenom, Team Liquid, Team Secret, Alliance, Nottis, Vincier, or Navi, Cloud9, January 25th, and Bears are the eight teams. So uh, one spot up for grabs. What do you think of these eight teams? Is there any that they're missing you feel like, or you think they got it right? Well, 
I mean, I think that the Europe qualifiers are, I mean, they're always really interesting, right? That's kind of like the cop out if somebody asks you, you know, what qualifiers are you excited to watch? Oh, obviously <laughs> Europe, just because they have so many good teams. Yeah. Um, I think in this one that honestly, there's really no weak links. I mean, I know I hate to say this, but like <laughs> Alliance is probably, I mean, the top four would have to be Ed Finham, Liquid, Secret, and then, and then probably who? yeah, probably Cloud Nine. Honestly, yeah, I think they do. Um, yeah, but you know, some people might be like, uh, I don't know about Liquid, but they're they're going to come out really strong. Like I can almost guarantee that. Um, but yeah, just in general, like Bears even has some really cool players on it. I don't, I've never heard or like seen Firo play before, but Fada obviously from Liquid coming back. Ferev is like one of the best offlaners in the world, in my opinion. Um, Yapsor, obviously incredible support. He's like probably the next crit or Jerax, honestly. And then 343, um, I don't know a ton about him, but, you know, like this team has potential to be really good. And yeah. obviously like the... the yeah. Fanatic team as well. With yeah, the, these are like <laughs> these kind of wild card teams. Exactly, Bears in January twenty fifth. Because January, just to clarify, it's Era, Koikva, Trixie, Hani, and Cinderin on January twenty fifth. So now, as far as the team that I would like to see actually be the top team in this event, going with my heart, I would love to see January twenty fifth. <laughs> that, <laughs> that is an awesome roster, and I, I would be excited to see them do well. Now. He's in my brain, on the other hand. Yeah, there's a couple of other teams that come to mind. But most, I, I think you could argue the team to beat, though, is probably at Fina, right? Like, kind of, because they're the ones that had all that hype at the Boston Major, and they're coming off of that. But they haven't played since. This is going to be their first actual appearance, unless I'm missing something, that they've uh, played. In yeah, I can't now, remember so. them playing anything. They've been playing uh, a lot of lower priority games, I know that. <laughs> dude that's just a whole other topic the whole lp system is ridiculous right yeah. now we, could, we um, could talk about that for a while but let's not let's not go there no but yeah at phenom my team uh i think that you have to choose. oh what, what do you think do you think it's at phenom or somebody else um you know what i think that it's gonna be really interesting just because like at Finham, like you said, they haven't played, so we get to find out whether they were a flash in the pan in Boston and just kind of like... Because Dota's one of those games, you know, like where momentum actually really matters. You know, if you are confident that you're playing well, then you're going to do really well because everybody believes in themselves and the team, and then they'll go for like these crazy plays and they'll just pull stuff off that you like normally wouldn't see, which makes exciting Dota, but... There, is, there are those teams that, like, are super good for one land, and then they just kind of disappear. Yeah. Like, MVP Phoenix kind of springs to mind, for example. <laughs> they, um, they got dissected, man. <laughs> All those players well, were, like, everywhere else. Yeah, exactly. Um, but for, like, a couple lands, they were, like, super on fire because they were really aggressive, and they fought really well as a team, and it kind of, like, surprised people. Yeah. Um, and so Ad Finum is kind of, like, in that same mold. They're super aggressive. Like, maybe next time basically only plays Bounty Hunter, and Ricky, he like gives them vision and then initiates fights and obviously is Earthshaker, but um, they just fought super well and they outfought teams. They weren't necessarily better than them. Um, I think it's Secret and, and, and Liquid, honestly, as the top two teams by probably a tier in this qualifier, but we'll see. Liquid's interesting because they also just picked up GH, if I'm not mistaken, and that gives them like, what, three 9K plus MMR players on the team? And then you have, yeah. like, an 8,500, but then you got Kur Kuroki, who I guess is, like, only 6,500 or something, so some some scrub, but um, <laughs> overall yeah, a strong correct. team, though. Yeah, um, Yeah. the thing about Liquid is um, most people probably just remember how bad they were like, <laughs> leading up to <laughs> the Boston bad. Major qualifiers. Um, and I actually I, I write articles for liquiddota.com and oh, edit okay. for them. So, so like, you're biased. I, got to, I am biased. I will admit that. But I also get to, uh, I got to hang out with like um, the CEO of Liquid at, at TI and kind of like talk to him a little bit. And so what, when they were having that down period, I talked to him and it really was just like their team communication was terrible. Yeah. Like as a team, they just couldn't communicate. They had all these really skilled players, but they were like, they were all playing pubs basically while everybody else was playing as a team. Um, 
And if you have, if you've noticed since that Boston major qualifier, they literally haven't played a tournament. Yeah. Except they, for the one where they had GH stand in. And yeah. Other than that, they've just been scrimming. They, they like practice and scrimming. That's they, they did win DreamHack before that, though. So they, they, they do have a little bit of success as of late. But yeah. Um, I mean, like I said, they, their skill cap is ridiculous. Like, Matoma Man, Miracle, Mind Control, and GH all together. Like, each one of these guys yeah. is, there's like a. Uh, a highlight reel for them on new for. I, I like how we're, I like how we're leaving out Kiriki and just like yeah, he, and then he just kind of finishes the the lineup, I guess. That's well, player. you know, <laughs> he's no. pretty good too. He's pretty. Pearl's, good too. Pearl's a really really good captain and yeah. also a really good in his own right. Um, and I think that was kind of one of their problems is that uh, with him and Bulba, they were both four players originally. Or Bulba was an off laner, but like they both had kind of like the four position play style, and they couldn't really figure out who was supposed to be like the sacrificial player to support their team, really. And so, like, first they were just putting Bulba on only like Omni Knight and Oracle, and they're like, try this, yeah. and then they started putting Roki in the position five, and just like they couldn't figure it out. So, with you know this much time spent practicing scrimming, I think they'll probably have all the kinks worked out, and I'm really excited to see them in the midst of all these other teams that have been kind of grinding the game. Yeah, there's uh, so many of these teams. This is the European region, though, against what is actually going to happen. Who the hell knows? But uh, you look at the groups. Obviously, this is other information that came out. We, we know the groups now, you know, the top two advancing on. I, I don't know. I'm having trouble leaning either way as far as which is the tougher group. I, again, I feel like that's really just question marks on the other side. you got the wild card teams. I feel like you'd maybe lean more, a little bit more towards group A, to be honest. Be and I say this because... And this kind of sucks to say, but Alliance, they've been struggling. They have not been doing too well lately. Uh, as much as I love the players on that lineup, uh, they haven't been doing too well. January 25th, as much as I would love to see them do well, they are kind of a newer team. Cloud9 is kind of, they're still, yes, they finished second at the WESG, but I still feel like they're really trying to prove themselves as actually a uh, respectable team as far as a Tier 1 team even goes. So, um and then you're 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 selling me liquid, man. You're, you're acting like liquid's gonna win this whole thing. So I'm sold that liquid's gonna dominate this group now. But so I would I would lean towards Group A being the tougher group. But yeah, I would agree with that as far as definitely more contested. Um, like you said, I mean Alliance. Like everybody loves Alliance. I I love Alliance, but it's just like their playstyle really hasn't evolved enough yet. I don't think. I don't think they're like caught up with the other teams right now. Um, and Group A also just has like a bunch of wild cards. There's like the new Navi with only two Ukrainian players, which is kind of unheard of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's Bears, there's Adfinim. Uh, both groups will be interesting games, but definitely A is going to be the tougher one to come out of. Probably, I would say it'll be Adfinim and Secret. I don't think Navi is going to gel it enough yet. Yeah, and I just don't know about Bears. <laughs> so I yeah. No, that, that, that's, that's a safe bet for sure. I have Phoenix Secret. Now, if he's, they're kind of another kind of wild card team. I know uh, Biver is a former Haunt player as well and just joined there. So I actually had him on my first episode. I uh, got to oh, talk yeah. with him about uh, what, what he's like and about the, the new team. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll see how they do. But yeah, add Phoenix and Bears and then Team Liquid. And who's the other team from Group B if we had to choose? I, I would say Alliance. I want to say Alliance, but I Dude. don't know. I don't know. Man. That's tough. Coin flip, three-way coin flip. Yeah, right? three, three, just get, yeah, three-way coin <laughs> flip. Does that exist? We need to, we need to create it. Um, it's like if Cloud Nine can play consistently, I would pick them. But they seem to be one of those teams that's just like up here one game and then down here another yeah. game. They looked good. At, they did look good at WESG. Now again, that's a very not really. Let's not take a lot from it tournament, but they did look good. They, they, they played pretty well. I'll give them that. So. Well, the Dota was pretty good at WSG. Sure. I, I enjoyed a lot of the games, but... You, yeah. you, you must not have watched uh, much of the group stages. Because it was uh, uh, not there as were, good. Yeah. Okay, so there were definitely... The Dota was exciting. It was probably the best. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there were some unique strategies, as I like to say. Yeah, exactly. Some interesting decisions. <laughs> Those are the nice ways to put it. Yeah. All right, we're, we're getting caught up here on the, the one region. we still got plenty more to go over. Um, I know Europe's obviously the big one, though. So, But uh, American qualifiers, let's take a look at that now. This is one that I know you said uh, probably the cop-out answer and even 
most entertaining about or most excited for the European region. I'm, I'm all American, baby. I, I like the American region lately, and, and I actually genuinely am most excited for this region here. Uh, as I, I have been doing a bit of casting myself, and you know, I've been getting to know these teams even more. Even teams from like South America and these these tier two teams that are trying to break into the scene. And so we look at this lineup. We got DC, which we've we've already discussed that the fact that they're here instead of EG, in my opinion. Now now that we know EG won this Dota pit, though, I guess you could probably say that you know, it's okay that they got invited. Anyways, that's that's another discussion. So DC Team NP Complexity Wanted. That's the new PPD team, of course. Uh, team Onyx, Team Freedom, Infamous, and SG Esports. So we got a couple of South American teams thrown in there, mixed with a couple of Pug teams, or whatever you want to call them, these newly formed teams. Right. And then you got the standards, of course. So well, what do we think about these uh, these teams here? Is there anything? Um, well, I'm happy that the American region could put up a full roster of teams to oh, play geez. the qualifiers. They're going to um, be better. And actually, yeah, like a lot of these teams – kind of make it interesting i mean i know that like i think it was last week in the show we there was the question should you take wesg seriously you know who knows but infamous and sg esports actually look pretty good oh yeah um and sg esports for example has hfn who's like uh he was number one mmr for a while i think he was like one of the ak players one of the first ak players um on the ladder and king rd is sort of like a legend in in brazil um, so actually, SG Esports has some like pretty good players, and not saying that they're going to compete with DC or any of like NP or Complexity, but they could you know take a few games off of some of these other teams and end up like spoiling some somebody. And yeah. Infamous as well placed even higher than SG Esports, um, and yeah, uh, Peruvians, but they're really good. And this team specifically has been playing together for so long. Um, with a few roster changes, but I feel like uh, Kotaro Hayama and Excel and Benjaz have been together for like a couple of years at least. So, um, and then three wild cards, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. That's that's kind of the theme of this American region. I feel like, that, especially with Wanted and Team Onyx, who the hell knows what's going to happen with those teams? Like they could come out and. Right be dominant they could also come out and just be flat and because and, and it could show that they haven't been practicing a whole lot which i tend to believe that's going to be more the case but we'll see we'll see how that plays out for them um dc they're on another level the dc is going to probably win the american region it would be an upset in my opinion if they do not now with that said I do think there is potential for upset. I really do, especially from, obviously, you got Team NP and Complexity. But, uh, you know, I, I, I too, agree. And I'm, now, I'm not saying I'm picking a team like Infamous to win it all, but they can actually play very well. And they're another team. They took Cloud9 to three games in the semifinals, it was, of the uh, WESG event when they, when they competed there recently. So, again, another, it's like, let's not overreact to it. But, um, <laughs> yeah, spoilers can happen. Now, I'm also looking at these groups right here, and I definitely am confident saying Group A is the harder group. I mean, Group B, in my opinion, you got you got Team NP and then probably one of the South American teams. Again, I, I, don't, I just don't know if I can see Team Onyx and this newly formed team really actually being able to overtake them. I'm a yeah, little disappointed on the organizers also that they put both the South American teams in the same group. Yeah. Yeah, like you were saying with Nahazel, some of the group making and just like the seeding in tournaments has been, it's it's like people who do the brackets don't really understand storylines very well or something. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I would, yeah, I, I don't, it just doesn't make sense to me. Like what, that, that seems like an obvious, like, okay, we got two South American teams. Let's just at least put them in different groups. Nah, we'll right. just throw them in the same group, so. Well, yeah, but then the South American teams take both group B spots and then, who knows what happens after yeah. that? Yeah, oh, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> and you got Team uh, Freedom. They're another up and coming team, and they're, they're probably not going to make it out of the groups. But no, um, I mean, yeah, I I actually think that Wanted could take one of the spots. To be perfectly honest, they I just, could. Yes, I really believe in the power of having a leader um, yeah. on a team that is proven. You know, and it really depends. Like with EG, for example, PPD had time to build this roster of people like who would listen to his calls. Um, 
because that's the type of captain that he is. And he's said it in interviews before that like basically he makes the calls and then there's like a few other people with like contributing information, but it's basically people do what he says in game. And that's just how his teams work. Um, and I know that QO was like the main caller on MVP. Like people would play around QO. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how communication works, I think. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, potentially they could be really, really good because Chessie is a very solid, very solid mid laner. Oh, yeah. QO is obviously hyper talented. PPD is great leadership. And then um, JO has been around the scene for a long time playing on like tier two, three teams. So he has lots of competitive experience. And I'm not super familiar with Boris, but. You know, we'll see. Yeah, I don't think anyone is, but I will say they they do match up against DC. So that if you if you uh, show the matches on the on the Wikipedia site here, they match up against DC, and then it's complexity versus freedom in the first. So I, I'm guessing they're doing like a GSL format for the group stages. It looks like. Um, yeah. So it's it's going to be a tough way to start there for wanted, but obviously it's it's going to be a tough uh, event in, in overall. I mean, you can't expect a, a free walk or anything like that by any means. So. Um, yeah, and then, then there's complexity. I we really don't talk too much about them. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of the team, and I would love to see them doing well. And but it's this is going to be uh, uh, very curious to see how the uh, how the group shape up and then go on from there. But DC has to be the favorite. I just don't think there's any way around that. Considering I think that, you can safely say that DC will qualify. Yeah, they they should be the ones to qualify. But th that's what that kind of goes back to the the fact that you know EG got invited over them and. One of those two teams was going to have to go through this gauntlet of, of the American scene, which we haven't said often, but it's kind of turning into that. There are a lot more up and coming teams again, especially with the Onyx and Wanted, and you got the South American scene. So, yeah, that's the uh, that's the American region now, and uh, definitely looking forward to seeing more of that. Then definitely. there's these other regions. Uh, no, <laughs> there's the, the CIS <laughs> region. Again, I I, I don't want to spend too much time on these because I don't know about you, but I I personally don't know too much, and I don't frankly plan to watch really that much but um we got um, it's, yeah yeah so it's interesting that they split europe and cis for True. this tournament because in star ladder they're they're together which makes the europe qualifier and star ladder like even more intense um but here with cis i think that it's most likely going to be virtus pro and vega squadron um the i would say team spirit is probably like the third strongest team here um yeah looking at those these rosters it's i would say Virtus pro and vega squadron vega squadron is a really scary team like they're one of those teams that people kind of forget about for a while like every time they have a little bit of a roster shakeup, everybody's like eh, vega squadron like they never really came out and and did a whole lot but then when they put the the roster together um with I mean, Dit Yura, former Navi, G, former Virtus Pro, arguably the best CIS mid, um, aside from, like, maybe, you know, uh, no one. Yeah. And then you've got Mag, who's been a Tier 1 offlaner uh, before and consistently for a while, Seema the Slayer. Uh, and then Sonico, the best support from the CIS region by far on the same team. Uh, they're going to be... Like this team, I think can challenge British Pro, honestly. Yeah, no, they're they're coming fresh off. We'll talk about this just a little, a couple of minutes here. But they uh, they won their pre qualifier event. They beat uh, they actually beat February twenty fifth, and as well as Cloud Nine, if I'm not mistaken. To or wait, did they? No, they lost to Cloud Nine. That's right, they lost to Cloud Nine. Oh, but yeah. they they did take them to three games. I think it was, and it was a good series there. So completely forget what I just said there. But the point is <laughs> that yes, they are a competent team that most certainly could do well. Another case though here I feel like, and maybe this is me kind of not knowing enough about all these teams but you do look at this and it's just like the American region where it's Virtus Pro has to be the favorite. Like you got Virtus Pro and then you got the other teams. There are other teams like Vega. I think Rebels actually you can't overlook either. I do. I have got the chance to watch a little bit of Rebels. I uh, cast them in the Pro Dota Cup that I've been casting along on, on the side here and there. Um they used to be known as Flipside, I believe, and uh, they actually uh, okay, are yeah. potentially a pretty good team too. So uh, they they're going to be one that I look out for. And, and then there's just one more that worth mentioning before moving on here is LQ um, Scandal. Funny. They got Scandal, okay. who is a really old school Han player. 
way back <laughs> nice. in the day. So that that's why I like that team. They're gonna win it all. Probably not. But <laughs> well, the CIS that. region is just one of those like you never really know what's gonna happen there. Um, but I agree that Virtus Pro is tier one. Then you've got Vega, Spirit, and then the rest of them. Yeah. And again, who knows what'll happen? But I think it's pretty safe to say. All right. That that is locked up. <laughs> yeah. So that uh, that's gonna be fun to watch there. Keep in mind at least. And then we got the Southeast Asian region. A uh, little little bit more of a diversity as far as the the chances go, in my opinion. And looking at the teams right here, we got Warrior Gaming Unity, Team Faceless, Fnatic, TNC Pro Team, Execration, Signature Trust, Mineski, and Rex Regum, which I don't know who that is. But the other seven, I'm actually somewhat familiar with. Um, this, this, I could see this not really, uh, this is like the European region to me where there's potential for several of these teams to, uh, to win it. Warriors give me unity. They obviously, uh, had a decent time with the Boston major. They made it to the round of eight and I think to the surprise of a lot of people, you got faceless who literally as of this AM in the morning here at the Dota pit tournament, they got third place and did very well. Fnatic, I who knows. <laughs> they don't like, even have a carry yes, list. They down. do not <laughs> actually have a carry player. So if you're if you're a seven thousand plus carry player, reach out to Fnatic. Uh, they might want you. TNC winning W. They all have their storylines. Is my point. So, I it's it might it. What do you think of what I'm saying here? Do you do you feel differently, or do you feel like the same way that it's up in the air? Well, I feel like SDA region. They always have like the same six teams. And then a couple other sort of like lower tier teams that that are in these qualifiers. So uh, Warriors Gaming is always there. Fnatic's always there. Execration's always there. TNC, Signature Trust are always always in these qualifiers. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think SEA just like every other region seems to be getting closer and closer. Um, we'll see how Execration does without Abed, um, and we'll see how Warriors Gaming Unity does coming off of their good performance at Boston. Um, I mean, I have no confidence in Fnatic, honestly, in this I one. I don't either. Just, so, and Faceless was disappointing at Boston, but I'm happy that they stuck together because the team has good potential. Um, and they've been doing interesting stuff with just, like, running black on Pudge. So he's, like, not yeah, carrying anymore. And he's been, like, destroying teams as his Pudge, specifically. Um so it'll be interesting. I think all these qualifiers are going to be pretty interesting yeah. to see who comes out of it. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I agree there. I, again, I feel like the American region, there's a one clear cup. But, but even I know I was just saying about the CIS, you got Virtus Pro. But yeah, I could see one of those other teams winning. And then, yeah, Southeast Asia and Europe, um, it does feel like it's who the hell knows. But uh, all these teams, at least uh, most of them have their, their chances for sure. So. Um, and then you look at the groups. I mean, I can't really lean either way. Uh, it seems like they're both pretty even there. Signature Trust is kind of a, another team that – now, Signature Trust is interesting because I thought that they actually changed their roster to what was a former Han team. <laughs> that's, how I, that's how I recognize a lot of these teams because obviously the Han players coming over. But there was an announcement that happened recently where they literally picked up a, a Han team, a, a Thailand Han team, but <laughs> – this isn't that roster, though, so I, I don't know what the deal is or what's going on, but um, I guess this is a roster that's actually been around now for a bit. Blackles, I know, is a player from Thailand that is well-respected in the Southeast Asian scene, so not hmm. the team that I was hoping it was, basically. But Maybe they just have a secondary team now or something they like might, that. Yeah, that, that might be it, actually, but <laughs> wasn't them, so oh well. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, that's uh, that's the Southeast Asian qualifier, and that's the Dota 2 Asian Championship. So you got four qualifying events coming up. Looking at the groups there, as well as the, they announced all the uh, the eight teams for each one. So um, now there's another event that uh, is going on, and so we'll jump into this one now. We got the Star Letter I League Star Series. The name of this tournament is absurd. They really need to work on that. <laughs> just add more words. Let's, Let's just go. keep Let's going. Go like keep the one. words coming. Yeah. Um, but uh, this is the European region now. So as I was kind of getting at earlier, well, even though I was wrong, but the point was there. They had a pre-qualifier. They had a pre-qualifier to determine the final two teams of this event, which would then be an eight-team group stage match. Now, Horde and Cloud9 were those two teams that actually ended up qualifying out of the pre-qualifier. So they're going to be joining the other eight. 
this is an update as of today, actually. Um, Vegas Squadron and Friends are currently playing right now. They're playing a best of three. The winner is actually going to be another team because, and actually, I'm in a Skype channel. I did see this, that Virtus uh, Pro dropped out. Uh, VP uh -huh. is no longer in this event. I don't know if it's because of just so much going on or whatever it is, but they dropped out. So that's why they're playing this now one more additional qualifier here. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, and Vegas Squadron's down. How about that? You were just hyping up this team quite a bit, and they're losing one nothing yeah, to France. So. Friends. Taking it to them. Uh, but, yeah, so that'll be the eighth team, whichever that is. But then you look at the other teams, Secret, Phenom, Liquid, and Na'Vi, Cloud9, Alliance, and Horde. So very similar, of course, to the DAC um, with some slight differences, though. Uh, VP not being there does take away a little bit for sure. Team Liquid right. is there, though, so I'm sure you like their chances. Fanboy. <laughs> Fanboy over here. Horde is one that I'm a little surprised that they qualified Frankly, they, they haven't been doing all too great as of late, but um, they, they didn't even make it out of the group stages at the WESG. And I feel yeah, like they've they really got to do that, but I don't see them doing well here. They're kind of the only new team that we didn't talk about before. So, Not Yeah, I mean, they're like they're like the secondary Alliance Junior or something like that. They're all <laughs> Swedish. They've got like the same logo. Um, are they under the same? Yes. Owners? It they is. Are. It is cool because Aki and Loda, I believe, are split ownership, and uh, okay. Aki is the leader of Horde, and then obviously Loda's for Lion. So, I think gotcha. that's how it works. But well, two yeah, of these teams I mean, make it. By the way, you get two qualifying spots. Okay. I mean, yeah, it's. I guess the addition of the CIS region is not quite as exciting without Virtus Pro being there. Um. So it, again, it's it's probably going to be a fairly similar similar result to the the DAC quals, but um, in my mind, there's, in my mind, there's three teams. You got Secret, Phenom, and Team Liquid. Navi, I'm not as sold on as of late. I, I feel like it's like those three teams are going to compete for the top two spots. Yeah, I feel like Secret looked pretty good at. Um, dota pit so like uh liquid obviously secret yeah i would agree with that i mean i honestly i i really don't know about ad Phenom, to be perfectly honest i don't know I'll how they're going to perform yeah. that's true that's um, very true i wouldn't put money on them <laughs> i don't know I'm, I'm a science person so it's like show me data sample size of yeah. a team being good and then i'll believe in it um don't get me wrong i loved watching them i was rooting for, rooting for them at boston they were so fun to watch but i just don't know whether they're going to be consistent enough to like grind out a bunch of qualifiers and like you and nahas were talking about this stuff is so tiring mm -hmm. playing i mean ranked pubs themselves are really tiring and when you're trying to qualify, like, to make money, because you're not even, like, playing for money right now, but you're qualifying to make money. So it's like, if you don't qualify for this tournament, you don't do anything for the next, like, three months, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's tough. And that can be extra levels of pressure. So we'll see whether they can be consistent as a team. We also notice that the format of this is different, obviously, than in DAC. It's actually just a group stage, and that's it. It's the top two out of the groups. And... Of course, the changeup is that they're all in the same group. And I actually kind of like this better. I like the idea that you're giving the teams to all compete against one another rather than having a little bit of the RNG element, you know, which group are we in? Who do we have to actually beat? Let's just say you have to beat, you know, everyone. So I, I personally do prefer this format, and I'm glad that they went with it for these uh, these qualifiers. So Yeah, no brackets at all. It's interesting. Nope. And at least it's groups. best of twos. If they did this, <laughs> if they did best of ones, it would be. Oh, like, that would be brutal. Yeah. No, best of twos. <laughs> that's yeah. No, thank God yeah. it's best of twos. Um, the American region. We'll go over to there now. We got uh, the eight teams in the American region, and we're looking at complexity, DC, Infamous, NP, Onyx, Duwop, Team Freedom, and Dialcom. Now, so a little bit of a difference here. You got Duwop in. Uh, they're kind of uh, another one of these tier two slash three teams, whatever you want to call it, and. Um, you know, players like Snake King, 747, and crew. They were the last invited team to this qualifier, which I found interesting. I feel like Team Freedom arguably deserved it a little bit more if you're going to be inviting a Tier 2 team to this event. Right. But um, 
Freedom ended up qualifying anyway, so there you go. And then you got Dialcom, actually. Another team from South America, specifically from Peru. Um, they are actually going to play this event as well. Now, Dialcom has an interesting storyline where they got a couple of players, from my understanding, that are banned. They're banned from official Valve events, the majors. Oh, yeah, Z-Talk. Z-Talk and Van, if I'm Van. not mistaken? Yeah. Yeah. So they did pretty well at the WESG with that said. Um, but yeah, So they'll kind of be fun to watch maybe to see how they do in such event. They are good players. But uh, they don't get to compete in as many. They don't have as many chances as other teams because <laughs> of that. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's kind of event. unfortunate, but, I mean... What are you going to do? do? Exactly. Also, one other thing about this before I uh, let you talk here is that EG is still not announced for this event yet. Uh, go going to the main event portion, they actually are still waiting to announce a direct invite team. Obviously, That's Logic cool. would tell you that it's going to be EG, but they've had this up now for at least a month, if not longer. So I'm very curious what's going on with that. EG's not in these qualifiers, so if they don't announce EG as being the invite team, then EG won't be here. <laughs> so, I don't know what to yeah, expect with that. That seems kind of unbelievable, because <laughs> all the other teams from all the other tournaments yeah. are in the qualifiers, right, for this? Pretty much, I, I believe so. So, it's th that would be very curious if they're not the other team. So, yeah, with that, I saw somebody asking that in chat earlier. Yeah, I, I would expect it's going to be EG. Although, OG is not playing this tournament then, right? They were they not an invite team? They no, are. They're, they're. Wait, no, I'm those, looking at something else. No, for Star Ladder OGs, they're not in the qualifiers and they're not an invited team. So maybe oh, maybe Star Ladder's waiting to hear back whether OG or EG wants to play. That's a good point. Okay. Huh. Uh, yeah, no, I didn't notice that. But every other team that you would consider tier one is here, I believe. So yeah. at least in the qualifiers. Somebody in chat is saying Crit said on his stream that they do not plan to play in it. All right. There you go. So maybe they invited EG, and yeah. Crit was like, no. Nah. And then OG's probably also like, eh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> we're, we're busy. <laughs> it's only 135k for first place, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Eh. <laughs> All right, well, we'll see. Yeah, $300,000 tournament here. Uh, but, yeah, so back to the American qualifiers, though, uh, for this region, keeping that in mind that they aren't in it. Um no, again, not much different, though, than what we already went over with the, the DAC. Very similar teams as far as uh, who's going. Now, Wanted is not in. That's actually the one thing I did want to bring up. Wanted is not here. I got to think, you know, that's – I wonder what PPD thought about that and, and many others. <laughs> um, well, I, I think that they were really – I mean, he said he doesn't. He didn't think they were going to play that many qualifiers. Like, they're just playing a few to try it out. Yeah. And so they, they probably just – didn't even register for this one would be my guess all right like they probably weren't a team in time to play in the opens and i like to create drama so they were told <laughs> that they're not invited no all right well then you <laughs> know pj possible. salt <laughs> i i will say this if it came down to inviting a team such as doo-wop or wanted to this event I, I could see both ways. I really could because Watch is the sexy team. They're the team with the the new name, the PPD, obviously, and you know those big name players with the potential to be good. But then you have a team in Duop that has been playing a lot of events. They've been playing a lot of you know these tier two, tier three events, and you gotta you know respect that. You you have to give them some love if they're grinding that out. So I I'm okay that it is Duop. And again, like you're saying that we don't even know what the actual decision, like if that was even a decision or anything. So. Right. Uh, yeah. Too much. Star Ladder has always kind of been one of those like grindy tournaments. I feel like you know their their league teams are always playing. It's, yeah. They kind of like respect that. So maybe there was some of that um, in their decision making. All right. So those are those qualifiers. Now there's only one spot for the American qualifiers, by the way. So only one of these teams is actually going. And <laughs> Ken, you have to favor DC. <laughs> yeah, they're going to be the uh, the favorites here. So that's that's unfortunate. Yep. There's only one where Europe has it too, but I, I I get that. I do think Europe does deserve two. Yeah, I don't really think that you could give two spots to the America qualifiers. I mean, obviously, I know people are going to be. There's going to be like two camps. There's the like the complexity and probably Onyx fans that are going to be a little bit hurt, and then Team NP has their own fan base that's also going to be a little bit hurt. But I don't I don't know if if you can really justify. Well, beat DC then. Got to beat DC. Yeah, that, that's exactly. The game. You know? Got to win to make it. 
So that, that's um, what we want anyway. We want the best teams there. So yeah. like if you can if you can beat DC, then you totally deserve to qualify, and hopefully we'll compete for the title. Exactly. All right, so we got the South Southeast Asian region. Oh yeah, one other thing. Uh, there is no CIS as you kind of brought up before. It is just Europe, so that even makes a little more sense as to why there is two from there. Um, Southeast Asia, another case of one. Now this is actually underway already. It started last week. Um, and it's continuing on into this week. We're actually getting to a point where we're going to be knowing how many more matches. Yeah, they only have two more days worth of matches. So there's already been four, oh, wow. four teams that have been eliminated. Geek Fam, Mineski, Fnatic, and Power Gaming are already out. Um, it's coming down to these final four, and right now Warriors Gaming is in the best spot with TNC up there. Which is actually not that surprising. No, right? I'm not surprised. Yeah, these, these, this is shaping up to kind of be as expected, really, so... Yeah, we can see how Fnatic is playing. We can see how Excreation is doing without Abed. Um, it'll be – and TNC had the good showing. Um, they won WSG, right? Uh, TNC did, yep. Yeah. So um, I guess it's really kind of whether Faceless – because Faceless plays TNC on the 25th. They play three matches on the 25th, including TNC. Yeah, no, that's going to be the, the day to really see. That's Man, can you imagine if it comes down to Faceless against Fnatic in the last one and Fnatic can spoil them or something? They wouldn't, though. <laughs> Faceless will be like, nah, we got this. Right. Yeah. Or Fnatic I just won't show up. Fnatic will just be like, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. But yeah, that'll that'll be interesting. It's, you know, Warriors Gaming, I guess, proving that what they did in Boston is not a fluke because it looks like they, um, you know, did as expected here. Yeah. They two would execration. They two of the teams that they should have two out. It looks like. I, I'm trying to find them against Faceless. Oh, they played them on the first oh, no, day. One. They split. Okay, that was an important <laughs> series there. Okay, that was that actually might have been when Black was playing Carry. So it might have been a different team at that point. <laughs> <laughs> no Pudge. Yeah. Right. So yeah, this is literally like I said, two more days. You'll be basically have going into the AM here for the twenty. Fourth and then the twenty fifth the following day. So yeah, we'll know by uh, by tomorrow, which uh, which Southeast Asian team is going to the Star Ladder. There uh, is no break in in Dota, man. No, you just games all the time. <laughs> Always have to keep up with. I've noticed that since I moved over to Dota, it's 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 both ridiculous but at the same time awesome because plenty to talk about, plenty to watch, and uh, that definitely makes it uh, fun. So yeah, I have no problem with that. All right, so that's the Southeast Asian qualifiers, and that means uh, that pretty much uh, goes over all the qualifiers that we have. So, yeah, we got, the, again, the one more invite and then the four qualified teams that we need to figure out. Oh, yeah, one more thing I almost forgot to mention is the American qualifier. Turns out, actually, I'm going to be casting some of the American qualifiers uh, on behalf oh, of uh, BTS, actually. They're the official coverage for it, but they're looking to get some, some help for it, and I was like, let's do it, so... Uh, on Wednesday as well as Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So those days, I'm going to be doing the casting. So you get all the complexity games, I assume, right? Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> uh, I was actually hoping that the matches were here, but, yeah, they're still not here yet. So I don't know what uh, what matches I am going to be casting, but I would be disappointed if I cast a bit <laughs> of complexity. And so, but uh, that, that, I'm, I am looking forward to that, though, of course. So Awesome, man. That'll be fun. All right. But that's it for the Star Ladder. Um, those are the two events, the DAC and the Star Ladder. Starting, Star Ladder at least starts this week or continues even in the regions. And DAC, there is no dates just yet. But the event itself is early April, if I'm not mistaken. So they're going to need to figure out the qualifying information soon um, as far as what they want to do here. Yeah, it looks like it's very end of March and then early April. Oh, wait, yeah, no, it actually does say all that. So it does actually say the qualifier date. So America, they all start on February 3rd. Okay. So it's February 3rd to the 13th. So that's next Friday. No. Yep. Not, not no this breaks. Friday, but the next Friday. Yeah. So after the Star Ladder <laughs> qualifiers, then you got the DAC qualifiers. Yay. So awesome. anybody who wants to sleep, too bad. Yeah. <laughs> too bad. You're just going to have to watch. Oh, well. A lot of Dota. A lot of yep. Dota coming. All right, well, that covers uh, what's coming up. I think uh, I'm going to drop you here, Serenity. I want to thank you for, for joining me, having some good discussions here. 
Yeah, Appreciate thanks for it. having me on, man. No problem. Always, always happy to to have you on and uh, talk at some Dota here. So you know your stuff, especially thanks, about man. Team Liquid. I've been watching Dota for a long time, dude. <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right. Well, thanks again, Serenity. I uh, look forward to uh, talking with you more in the future again. You bet. Have a good one. You too. All right. So there we go. That's Serenity on. Talking about some of uh, the upcoming matches and what's uh, what's coming about, as he mentioned several times there. There's there's a lot coming. There's a lot coming, and uh, that's exciting to see as a Dota 2 fan in general. So, And also as somebody that creates content, both in video and podcast here, it's it's nice to have that happening. You know, it gives me stuff to talk about on said shows. At least it makes it easier to get stuff to talk about. So. With all of that said, there really is not much uh, much else more to go over other than things that I happen to learn. This is uh, this is one of the segments, one of hopefully more to come. I, I've been kind of going over some ideas. If you have any ideas that could be fun uh, as far as segments go, that would be fun to talk about on the podcast uh, or kind of do as far as like whether it's a game or whatever. You know, feel free to message me. Let me know if it's something that uh, if you have a good idea. Uh, this is one, though, kind of things that I've learned. So for those that don't know, I do a personal stream here Excuse me, on my channel where I play a lot of Dota. I've been grinding a lot of MMR, you know, trying to get my way up there in the, the ranked Dota 2 scene and just passed 3,000 recently. Not to toot my own horn, but I feel like I'm a pretty good player. No, uh, been, been, been grinding, though, but there's still so much to learn about the game. And even as a caster and everything, I'm really just doing my part to, to make sure to, to learn all, all these things as much as I can. And so I figured it'd be kind of fun to go over things that I have to learn from this last week, um, going into this uh, this next week here. So it, it 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 could be a mix of just frankly stupid stuff that uh, that you're gonna argue like, oh my god, how'd you not know that? To like, oh, well, you know, I learned something too. So I hope it's the latter. I hope it's the oh, I learned something too reaction. But uh, we'll see. No, but uh, there's only a couple things for this week. Uh, there, there's one more thing. I'm gonna see if I can remember it, but. Anyways, uh, one thing is the item Solar Crest, as well as Medallion of Courage, the, the two of them, they do not work against BKB targets. They do not work against Magic Community targets. So that's that. It's that simple. It, it does say on the tooltip it, it, uh, it, it does not go through Magic Immune, so you'd figure that pretty much explains it right there. But I've never really looked at that, and so I, I kind of just brought it up the other day on my stream because uh, I happened to – have one or somebody on my team had one i was kind of wondering if it did so but i just i confirmed it though it does not work against bkb targets so there you go if they're magic commune don't bother trying to use solar crest on them. it won't work um another thing i learned was press the attack which is the w ability for legion commander it's the nice uh buff it, you know it increases the life regen and everything but it's also a very strong dispel ability which i i honestly wasn't too aware of i i, I knew that it may be dispelled but i wasn't aware that what it actually did dispel and there was one ability in the game that kind of caught me off guard it was the lasso ability the lasso from batrider went to lasso somebody and bring it back but then all of a sudden press the attack was popped and they're free to go they're they're good to go so lc good hero against the, the likes of somebody like a batrider or if you, in case if you need a lot of purges uh, against, uh, against a team that's maybe putting up a lot of debuffs. So um, there's that. There's uh, the press the attack ability being pretty good. Oh, yeah, there's one last thing, too, that I actually just remembered now that I did not write down. But um, channeling abilities and how they work with some items. Now, coming from Heroes of New Earth, so in Heroes of New Earth, you could pop a shrunken head or BKB while you're channeling abilities. So if I was Enigma and I was going in to cast a, an elemental, or <laughs> I'm getting the names confused now. If I was Enigma and I was going to cast a black hole on uh, on a team, and then I went to pop my BKB after I started casting it, it actually cancels it. And it cancels your channel, and then all of a sudden you look like an idiot, which I did. Um, but in Han, you actually can activate a BKB while you're channeling abilities, including... Uh, something like a black hole. So that's why I wasn't really aware of that before. But it turns out there are a couple of items that you can activate while you are doing a channel ability. And I found this out more so through Witch Doctor, uh, Channel of the Death Ward. Glimmer Cape or uh, Shadow Blade, or I guess technically even Silver Edge, you can actually activate those while you're channeling said ability. So if you go to Channel of the Death Ward or Black Hole even or whatever, you, know, you pop the Glimmer Cape on yourself while you're channeling, all of a sudden you know, it makes you more difficult to be stopped. Ideally, so 
Um, there's that. There you go. There's another thing that uh, I learned that you probably knew, but again, it's the, that's the point of this. We're learning together, and I am not afraid to <laughs> look like an idiot. So um, I know I do plenty. So yeah, that's uh, those are the couple things that I learned here as far as throughout this week, playing some Dota 2 and just talking with some people. So. Uh, and then I also learned about the Radiant Advantage from Nahaz earlier. Really do appreciate uh, having him on and talking some good Dota 2, talking the numbers and everything like that, and uh, about the whole rating, nearly 60%. I mean, that's – it was also interesting the way he described why he thinks that's the case. Now, I don't know how sold I am on how simply it comes down to the mental game in terms of the psychology part of it and, you know, it's the left to right. and Like, I get that, but – I do wonder if that means there's a flaw in the map design to an extent, and maybe there's going to need some tweaks to be made when it comes to said map design. Uh, I do feel like maybe certain shrine locations, uh, specifically the one at the top near the Roshan Pit, maybe it's a little bit stronger for the uh, Radiant side than the Dire side, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't really looked into that. I, I do feel like, though, that maybe there's going to be some eventual map tweaks if those numbers keep up, because I feel like that the Neither side with that much data involved should have more than a 55% win percentage over the other. And like that's even high, I feel like. So um, that'll be interesting to see how maybe that develops over time when it comes to uh, the map balance and everything. Anyways, guys, I think that pretty much covers uh, all that I learned. And, uh, well, all that, uh, that pretty much covers the Breakdown podcast for today. So... As expected, turned out to be a pretty good podcast, and uh, I'm glad that you guys could tune in for it, and hopefully you guys enjoyed it. So want to thank you guys for tuning into the Breakdown Podcast with myself being Breaky CPK, and uh, look forward to next week already. So um, thank you to all my guests, both Nahaz as well as Serenity there. Uh, I had a couple Zs on today, so. Uh, but, no, appreciate both uh, having on and talking some Dota too, and uh, big shout-out to also you guys tuning in and, again, going to be officially wrapping up here. So the Breakdown Podcast wrapping up for today. What is January 23rd, 2017, episode number three. I'll be back next week. I will also be back on my personal stream, of course, you know, in general throughout the week, as always, uh, playing some Dota 2. And then also I am casting it on behalf of BTS, as I mentioned earlier as well, for the Star Ladder American Region qualifiers on Wednesday as well as Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So, Check out my social media to get updates on all that, both Twitter and Facebook, all at BreakyCPK. And I look forward to seeing you guys next time here, wherever it may be. So have a good night, guys. I'll see you next time here on the Breakdown Podcast, episode number three, coming to a conclusion. Have a good night. Every spring